Good evening. Good evening. We are here at the Opinionated Podcast, and we have our guests. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, my name is Dr. Malsa Hojad Kushnia. All right. All Thank right. Thank you for having me here. Thank you for your listeners who are listening to me. I'm very excited to be here with you all. Thank you. Thank you for joining the show. Now, I was reading your bio and everything like that, and I, 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 I see where you grew up in the Middle East. Can you tell our listeners where at in the Middle East you grew up at? Absolutely. So I'm from Iran. I came here to U.S. when I was 20 years old. I grew up in an amazing, beautiful country with four seasons, great people, great culture, but a very oppressive, honestly cruel and violent, as you can see in what's going on in Iran right now, regime. So very much I'm familiar with duality of growing up in oppression and your right as a person being taken away while growing up with a very rich culture and a progressive mindset within my family and the people we were around. So it makes a very interesting complex to grow up in. <laughs> so, so what was life growing up in Iran as a as a, a, a young girl? Like, can you explain to us? Sure. So it's important to understand that Iran is using a specific religion, being Islam, in actually not Iran, but the regime, the, the regime that is in place right now. And you can see their brutality has used a religion and transformed it in the way it likes to use it as a vessel of oppression. Mm. Personally, I don't practice that. I'm very spiritual, but I want to always value people's choices to have a religion and put it out there that I don't think any religion outrightly emphasizes brutality, killing kids, adults, women, men, torturing people. This is what's happening in Iran right now as a name of religion to the point, to the point that they are doing everything they can to stay in power. What you're seeing in Iran, the way people are being killed, slaughtered, shot at in the street, hanged for protesting, is a, basically a magnified version of what we grew up in. Growing up, go ahead. Oh, no, I was saying, wow. Growing up in Iran, we had this understanding that you cannot talk about what is on your mind outside of the household. You will not say the wrong thing, express any opinion against the regime, express anything um, that it would be progressive because you just don't know who's listening. And you're talking about this reality that you would be kidnapped, you would be tortured, you would be killed, and no one would know what happened to you. To the point that I was just talking to some family members coming from Iran, and of course I've been here over 20 years, I'm, you know, have forgotten that. And I'm like, well, why don't I tell you what happened? They started to pump some sort of a gas. It could be some sort of a chemical weapons gas used in war in girls' school. Can you imagine? I'm a mother, I have a five-year-old. So I heard that and I was like up in arms. I was like, how could they allow this? Why are the parents doing anything? And then she reminded me, she's like, well, we can't say anything. We just don't know what, you know, they're just gonna come and take you and kidnap you and nobody will ever find you. And I was just taken back. That, that is the truth of my people. I mean, we're begging the world. I mean, I know this is not what we're here for, but we're begging the world. I mean, they pump gas in metro stations. What is this besides genocide? And I'm sorry, I'm getting emotional, but mm. how is anyone supposed to live when this is what's happening to them? It is unacceptable in this world and it's still happening. Jeez. But who open a version of that? All right. I, you know what? And it's and it's crazy to me because I have, you know, plenty of family men members that are like like Muslim and and very peaceful, just you know what I mean? Like overall loving, you know, from what I experience religion. So you know, they they pray a lot, they're very you know what I mean, they usually have words of wisdom um when I'm around them. So it's like 
to hear that it, it's crazy to me because to use to use that religion you know which i've i've only experienced good from to pretty much in well i don't know about enslaved but it is, is as close as you can to it people it, it just baffles the mind um that's crazy it, and, and let me ask you how old were you when you came to the u.s i was 20 years old wow so you you spent your whole like childhood adolescence coming into wow oh my gosh so now 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 being hit me as a foreigner in the western culture you know that's all they that's all they magnified on tv from us like was there a lot of different misconception was there some some sunlight from some of the darkness you was telling us about in your country like so Iran is a very, it's a culture with a lot of history. So Iranians are actually Persia, right? Before Iran became Iran, it was Persia. It, it was a vast country across all the way to your, uh, Turkey, all the way. It, it was like a huge space. And if you know about uh, the first, uh, our king, one of our, you know, far down uh, in the history of one of the kings, I think it was Daryush. He... You're good. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like, where did everybody else go? <laughs> um, <laughs> he started and put on the first declaration of human rights. Mm. And in that he wrote, everyone has a right to their own religion. And everyone has a right to their own um, language, written and uh, spoken everyone's beliefs and who they are is equally accepted. We're talking about many, many years ago, before Islam was ever brought to our country, before any of this. So we're people, and I'm not trying to blow our own horn, but we're people that come from a very rich culture of humanity and you know, being equal and respecting everyone, whoever they are collectivism, collaboration, hospitality, really doing what's right. We went through an eight year war in Iraq, right? We would have been, from the very beginning, it was clear that we weren't gonna win. But the people showed up because we believed in our right to be us. So, and then like throughout our history, there are many, you know, philosophers, writers, poets that kept our language. You know, remember that, you know, we were from, uh, we were from a culture that was taken over when the, when the um, Islam was brought over, religion was brought over, but we stayed for what we value. Actually, to, um, Monday is our new year, Persian New Year, that is being celebrated throughout the whole world. Anybody who's Iranian usually celebrates it. And this has nothing to do with the religion. It has to do everything with our beliefs as Iranians. So basically we're very strong, right? We're raised to be strong. We're raised to value any opportunity we are offered. We're raised to be good people for the sake of others. Mm -hmm. And those were the messages I grew up with. So there was this duality of people pushing me down, the regime basically and followers. You're not saying you don't worth it. You need to do this. You need to, you know, cover yourself up. You're just um, basically your existence is an eye candy for everybody else. You have to cover yourself up versus being told that you have a purpose. You are important. You have to use your mind. You have to think. You have to bring something to the world. Right. And those are the things I'm trying to teach my daughter, right, to be a good human being. Wow. Well, now I'm listening to that because I hear that, and you know, Christianity and and Islam is almost like it's pretty much uh, what is it like hand in hand. I think the what was it the sons of Abraham? I guess the one son would go on to later find Christianity, and the other son would go on to later find uh, find Islam. And and you're talking about covering up like. In both Christian and Muslim religion, at first, covering a woman to cover their head was was meant for, as they read in the Bible, for to keep the angels from lusting over the women. The angels would come and lay with the women, so they asked the women to cover their heads and cover their beauties up, so the angels wouldn't come lust with the women. 
But like anything, man gets a hold of something so powerful as religion, which everybody always want to look for. Everybody want to look to somebody to pray to or to bring food, water, and famine. They took the religion and twisted it. I mean, it seems like started oppressing, you know, oppressing the women and, and, and putting the men at the at the you know the head of the table, and y'all don't have a voice. Do do you kind of feel that way? Like the the men twisted the religion somewhat to make and to dominate the women. Some men did. So the ones that are running the regime definitely did, right? They put the women at the lowest end and abused them in any way they could. And that is what we're saying. Right? When this revolution has started with women and girls standing up for themselves and saying, we're not going to cover up. We have rights. We want a better life. And then with them, men stood up, right? Behind the girls came the boys and the men. And this revolution has started. This is speech of we want to live a better life. And they were killed. I mean, if you go back on Instagram and look at what's happening in Iran, it's like, First young people, then children, then grandparents. One after another group joined and was slaughtered to the point that now they're doing this to the whole country. Mm. How does that play on the how does that play on your mental psyche being that young and you know witnessing stuff like that? I never witnessed anything that horrific over here in America. So what did that do to you mentally as a person? Well, it was this combination like there's this innate fear that you walk on the street and you're not sure what's going to happen to you because you're a woman and people some not my people but you know the ones with the regime feel an ownership to you mm. i can tell you a funny story actually my friend and i got into a you know a taxi right to take us to wherever we needed to go well the poor guy tried to take a different route than the one i was familiar with and having grown up in that environment, I'm screaming. <laughs> I think I'm being kidnapped. So I'm yeah. screaming. And he's like, all lost. What's going on? I'm like, pull over. Get us out. Oh, wow. He pulls over. I give him the money. I get out. And my friend's like, what happened? I was like, he was taking us. And she's like, no, he was going around the corner. <laughs> it's just a different route. Oh. But he was for me, it was true. For me, it was like. I, obviously, I don't trust anyone in this setting. I'm, you know, unless I'm with someone I trust. Right. Getting into a taxi, you still take that chance. But this idea that if you're going somewhere that I don't know is that helplessness, is that very deep fear. Traumatized. Absolutely. Man. You know what? It's, it's so so. It's it's not all bad. Okay, so let's uh, <laughs> not all bad. I don't want people to think that you know what I mean. You you don't come with uh any any information that uh you know what I mean. But I, I feel like it was important for you to like tell your story about about that. But you eventually became a doctor. Okay, can you tell us about your decision to you know to go into to the field that you're in? So it really started in childhood as well. Okay. You know, I remember being in elementary school and looking at, you know, some kids being pushed aside. You know, there was this kid who I was friends with because she was a loner. Nobody wanted to be with her. She had some aggression issues. And one day we're running. I'm running ahead of her and I fall. And the whole school, all the teachers, everybody comes and starts blaming her. Sorry, I was running behind her. She was ahead of me. I fall. She was like way ahead of me. Everybody comes back and says, we saw her push you. <laughs> I'm like, no, she didn't. And everybody's like, no, we saw her push. You. And I'm like, she can. She's in front of me. And I'm like seven, eight years old. I think I was eight years old. Right. And just seeing the look on her face, the pain she was in. It really got to me and it made me want to be there for her. So growing up in this environment when you're educated, I mean, my family, everybody was educated, everybody was progressive, everybody was all about new ways of thinking along with what I described. It really influences you to not take anything for granted and just go for whatever you can be. So 
I was in university, I was studying nursing, and my brother came here, and six months later, he said, you have to come. You need to come here. You're going to have a better life. Wow. I came to U.S., and the first thing they said was, well, we're not going to accept any of your credits. If you had studied anything else, we would take it, but not that. Okay. So I started studying and I knew what I wanted to do. I wanted to study psychology, which I did till my bachelor's. And then um, as I, you know, talking to professors, everybody's like, no, what you're asking for is social work. You want this broad perspective. You want these systems and every dynamic involved. And it was true. And that led me to getting my master's, getting licensed, getting my PhD. And actually working with, you know, working in the jail, working in South LA, working with children and family services, working with severely mentally ill, working with addiction, all of this before I had a child and went into private practice fully. So it, all of those early life experiences mm. helped me be able to understand my traumatized client. Mm. So let me bring it, let me rewind a little bit because I want to sure. also, what was like, what was life like when you first like came into America what was your first impressions of America uh, impressions of America and when you got here how did that impression change of America you know change your view of America well I had this I mean I always was excited right it was just going to be this new experience what I was not expecting was the love the care the attention the opportunities the really willingness to be patient with me. Mind you, I came to America thinking I spoke English. And then I got here and I realized I really didn't. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but it was fun. <laughs> and what always stood with me was as I would struggle to communicate, people would calmly and gently wait and encourage me to do so. That was an experience that was new. Right? To actually have a space to be and to give permission. I mean, in my family, in my culture, everybody is like, you got to be strong. You got to do what is right. You got to, you know, fight for what's right. But here it was people were saying, it's okay. Take your time. You know, we'll stay here and wait for you. You know, when you're in oppression, there's no time. You got to go, go, go. So that was amazing to me. And I think that was what fueled me. There were a lot of struggles, mm -hmm. you know, not knowing the language, you know, having to figure out, not having family or friends around, having to figure things out on my own. It was very rough, you know, not knowing how to open my, you know, the little table that folds over you so that I can take your notes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. But, you know, it was every single step. There was always this support. You know, it was my family, my brother, you know, what I had learned back home, then eventually my husband. Everybody was just like, you can do this. You know, like I was raised up throughout my whole experience. And I did. You know what I like about that story? And because and it's weird because I just talked to somebody else who, who talked about coming to America and she was from Liberia. Um, or she was from Africa and she kind of told the opposite story. But what mm -hmm. I noticed about your story is like, um, since you came over and you dealt with what you dealt with, you came over pretty much as a grown woman. So like the way that you could, like, I would say appreciate things was a lot different and the way you took it in was a lot different. Uh, the person I talked to, she was a kid and she didn't feel welcome. And I was always confused. I was like, really? And I'm like, man, I'm thinking as a grown man, though, like, wow, like if you came and you had trouble speaking, then, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't make fun of you, but I'm a grown man. So I, I imagine okay. it's, it's rough for kids because yeah. they have to go through all the, the teasing and the, the, the hazing and stuff like that. But when you come over grown, it's like, oh, oh, no, I can stretch my legs out. I can do you know what I mean? <laughs> I can do what I want to do and, and actually help people here. So, yeah, I, I really like that part about your story. I just wanted to throw that in there. If I may comment on that, think about developmental needs of a child. You know, it's the development need of being accepted and belong to their family, to their communities, to their peers. Right. 
my story wasn't all, you know, roses and beautiful. Yeah. But what I chose to keep from it was the people who were there for me, yeah. not the ways I struggled. You know what I mean? But that was because I was grown. I did have a very different need. I had a need for mastery. And what I didn't have back home was an opportunity. Wow. Okay. And, and that's, and it's crazy because me being as, you know, you saying you have all these opportunities in this country. Yeah. Me being as a black man growing up in America, mm -hmm. we always felt not as you know, we felt that same oppression, but not as harsh as you, you know, we always felt like, you know, we couldn't belong. We could we weren't allowed in certain areas. It's like certain yeah. nice nights, nice towns you ride through when you, you ride through in your car and a uh, police pull out behind you it was like the automatic fear sets. And like, I know mm -hmm. I'm not supposed to be here, but I'm just taking this way as a shortcut to get through this town. And God forbids the light, the light come on, you know, they throw the lights on. It's like, dude, I didn't even do anything. Like, why are you pulling me over that fear sets? And it's like, yep. they always ask you. The first question the cop always asks you is, is not, you know, license and registration. But when you're in a nice neighborhood, it's like, uh, you know, what you doing over here? What you, what you, where are you coming from? Exactly. That's the, that, that's basically the, where you're coming from means to us and black people, like, you're not supposed to be here. So where are you coming from and why are you here? It's like, Dude, I'm I, I'm an you know I'm American. I'm 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 an American. Yeah. This is a shortcut to get home. Yeah. I understand this is maybe coming through a nice neighborhood and everything. I'm not out here to steal anything. You don't you know I'm coming from work. You know, uh -oh. yeah. Actually, I tell them that you're coming from work. Well, you know, what time you get off? Uh, you know, what business do you have over here? Uh, why did you take this way? Uh, license or registrations have you any drugs or weapons in the car is it, it all that leads up to at the end of the whole conversation i'm just gonna let you off with a warning <laughs> for what for doing for existing for being in where you belong i actually did a lot of work in i mean i've worked in the jails and i used to get uh, originally i would do a lot of education with the deputies and the staff but i'm enjoying that type of but it was just like, because they would always get on my case. Why are you so nice to them? Why are you treating this them? And I'm like, why should you, why are you treating them this way? We're talking about human beings. Who cares what they've done? Will they killers? Will they've done that? I'm like, okay, great. They're paying their price. That has nothing to do with me, mm. you know? And the level of how protective were my guys of me? I mean, they would show up in ways that I would was like, you know, I'm having a conversation here with a client. Can you stand a little bit over there? And soon I would realize that, like, there was a threat, you know, they had felt and literally created a wall of human beings next to me. Wow. Now I'm, like, getting all mad at them. I had to go and apologize one by one and say, I'm sorry, thank you. And they're like, we got you. Honestly, they were the most wonderful people. Granted, there was another side to them. But when I saw them, their humanity, they saw my humanity. Mm. And something amazing happened from them. A lot of them grew out of that. And honestly, I am extremely privileged. I have to own that. I have this color of skin. So the moment I walked in here, I was seen differently. My husband, who's darker, but didn't have those opportunities. Mm. You know, then I started to talk to people and that was actually my first experience. And when I started to understand the stories of what Americans such as yourself go through, to be honest with you, that was another fire under my, you know what? Right. Yeah. I was enraged. I mean, back home, you can't understand. It's a group of people. We are all, you know, discriminated against. All of us, man, woman, just because we don't agree. This was different. This was you in your own home being prejudiced against for nothing. Sorry, I'm having a lot of feelings about that. I understand. <laughs> Stop. No, I understand. It, you know what? I think they forget too. Like the, even the guards, they develop this, um, or the employees, they develop this thing where they forget that this is supposed to be really rehabilitation. 
Like it's no. not just like, oh, you're you're a criminal, you're a piece of garbage, so I'm gonna treat you like that and give you no respect. It's like, nah, a lot of these guys they need they need that rehabilitation. Like, it ain't gonna be everybody who gets it, but if you just treat them like trash, they're gonna probably go out. They're gonna think that way. And they're going to go out and do the same things that they already did. But what if somebody actually took the time? A lot of people need therapy. Yeah, Desperately. And on, and I do. Top, yeah, and on <laughs> top of that, and on top of that, that, that mentality, you have the act like you was talking about earlier, the, the racism, which is also heaped on top of that. Like I tell everybody all the time, I'm, my mother, I was born in 83. My mother was born in 65. My, when my mother was born, they was just in, uh, Ending segregation, which is not that long ago, you know what I'm saying? I'm talking about one generation removed. I remember talking to my grandmother before she passed away, and how she said she would have to go to a movie theater and she would have to sit upstairs. She wasn't allowed to sit where the people sat. She had to sit upstairs where the movie was actually reeling her and her and her mother to watch a movie, or how she went to school and. uh I remember she said the first time she went to school and the first time Puerto Ricans started to get an integrated her school in Philadelphia, that the blacks and the whites were separate. They did not know where to put the Puerto Rican kids at. They didn't know if they would put them with the white kids because they have fair skin or, or some of them were darker skin. Would they put them with the blacks? They had no clue where to put them. So they gave them their own section of the school. This is my grandmother I'm talking about. You know what I'm saying? So Racism in this country is not far, too far removed. And you can see, like you said, being in the jail system and how they treat the inmates and everything like that, you know. So, you know, being a black male, there's a lot of stuff that's heaped on our on our plate every single day. You know, uh, the fear of cops, the fear of your own people, the, the fear of, you know, other races is you know, always looked at as a monster. And I can only imagine you saying you being in the prison system, that got to be amplified by a hundred. You know, these guards, I remember I got locked up for one day, locked up for one day. And as I'm being going through the process, I have a black CEO and a white CEO. The black CEO, he's calm with me. He's telling me the procedures, breaking everything down. He's asking me for my information. We're just having a normal conversation. There's the white CEO talking down to me, throwing my stuff at me, calling me boy, just trying to degrade me. And I'm like, you're trying to get some a reaction out of me. Like, why? You know what I'm saying? I'm not even, I'm I'm in here because I missed child support payments. I'm not in here because I'm out selling some drugs or or I robbed their bank or did something crazy like that. I'm basically in here because I missed the cup. I missed my payments for child support because I didn't have a job at the time. Why are you treating me like this, bro? Like, I don't even need that right now. I just want to come in here and get out of here. So that, that's my personal experience. Yeah, yeah, see, I'm about to say, it seems like it, it stuck with you, too. Oh, yeah. It stuck with you. That's the things that happens to these guys. Things could have happened a long time ago in their life. What I'm saying is, you have to work through that. And these guys, a lot of them don't get a chance to know how to work through that or the tools to work through that. So can, can you speak to that? Like anybody like, you know, that you that you came across that you really had to break down some traumas in their life and help them get through it? I think throughout most, I um, mean, all of my career, that has been my work, you know. Yeah. I have this program that I use. I've developed this idea of corrective emotional experience. So the first and foremost step is this idea of creating a safer space. You know, when you're being mistreated for whatever reason at any level, trust breaks down. Your idea of safety breaks down. So why would you trust and, you know, really let yourself get in, you know, in a conversation and vulnerable with a stranger? Right. So the first step of program is proving to my clients that this is really a safe containing environment where they are going to be held, attended to, valued, not judged, listened, and felt and understood. When there is this bond that is developed, then we can move on to this collaborative environment where we start to understand what is at the root of the problem. 
what are the dynamics at play? What are the ways in which we're protecting ourselves from perceived threats? Threat that at some point it was real. Right? Based on the story you shared, the next time somebody talks down on you, it's likely that that memory triggers and you, your body language may even get harsh and tough and be very quick to respond because you will remember that sense of helplessness in that moment, the unfairness of it. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, you are definitely, you definitely right. That is. Sorry, I didn't ask your permission before I went there. <laughs> Okay, I, I, you know, I, I I have somewhat noticed that. Like, I have. Great, don't even think about it. it just kind of. It's second. It's second. It's almost second nature. Absolutely. This is what is going on. May I use that as an example? Yes, you may. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, what is going on is that in your memory, there's this moment of helplessness. The idea that at that moment you couldn't stand up in who you are and defend what was rightfully yours because somebody else had taken that away from you and used your vulnerability against you. And it is something you would never want to happen again. So anything that brings that moment up in the midbrain, in the limbic system, in the survival system, will cause a reaction of this will not happen again, fight, flight, I'm going to do whatever I can to defend myself from not ever going there. What that do, though, is that it starts to erode relationships. It starts to cause problems because it causes reactivity in a way that may not be necessary because, in essence, you're responding to an old trauma. Does this so far make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Definitely. So, so when we understand that and we go through the second phase of treatment, which is really understanding what happened, the third phase starts. And that's where I take you, for instance, since we're using you as an example, thank you for that. We will go to that specific memory. And in your case, I would help you rewrite it. I would give you the tools to actually stand up to him and say everything you wanted to say, to imagine reacting the way you wanted to do, creating a new narrative, right? In other places, it is to let the person really feel, cry, scream, whatever they need to get that release, that stuckness released, whether it is to gain a different perspective, that's a part of what it would right? What is going on with that white PO? What is his complex issues that feels the need to put somebody else down? That in essence gives you power back. Because in reality is that his powerlessness, that he needs to use the role to express, well, I'm not powerless anymore. He had no reason to come at you that way unless it was about his own trauma you know, his own fears. Right. Does that give you your power back? <laughs> yes, it does. But, Jesus. You know what? It, uh, interesting part of what you just said, and, 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 and we can continue, but I tend to do that a lot. Like, after something, something weird like that happens, I will drive away, and I will just think of all the stuff that I should have said, almost obsessing about it. Like, hours hours saying man if he would have said this i would have said that and he would have just playing the whole thing out is that weird no again it's that moment of helplessness mm. and what you want to do with that is to become compassionate to the child you once were now we're going to the inner child work right to go to the child you once were and say there's some moments where you wanted to say things and you couldn't you wanted to say things and it wasn't safe you okay? Okay. Yeah. Nah. Okay. All right. I had to know think where about, that's coming from. I had to think about that. Okay. So within oh your, it seems very vulnerable, so we're not going to go there, but I want you to, within your own psyche, revisit that child and become kind to him. It wasn't his fault, even if it appears oh, as okay. so. Hold on. <laughs> All right. Hold on. Hold on. I definitely need therapy because... Sorry. Okay, that hit me a little bit. All right, let's go. All right. 
Yeah. All right. Let me see the virtual hug. I, look, I, I appreciate it. That hit me just right in the place where I'm just going to come. I'm going to leave that for another time. All yeah. right. I didn't this expect is... that. Okay. Can we, can we edit anything? Can I say whatever I want to say? You can say whatever oh, yeah. you want. No, no, I'm keeping all that. Yeah, yeah. That child that you just felt needs you more than anybody else in the world. You are a man now. So you can show up for him, defend him, protect him, and value him in a way that he may never have had. And if nothing else happens, is take that from me and turn that into being, if you're a father, be his father too. Okay. Wow. Right. That is, that was, I never had nobody. I, that. I had no, I never had, listen to that, ever had anybody break it down to me like that because. I, you know, it was a lot of stuff as a child that I went through. There's a lot of stuff I shouldn't have seen as a child that I went through that I packed right. away. But it was a lot of, but in that same token, it was stuff that was also good. But somehow, was, you know, that when them demons that I packed away, they always somehow seem to always find their way to the surface. And I don't know how. Because they are locked. See, what we call demons are actually our anger and our survival. You know, that feeling that we had at that moment, like the feeling, the rage I felt towards these people putting uh, gas into, the, you know, girls at school. And that moment I was ready to rip whoever apart. And I'm not sorry to say that. I will do that for my child. I will not stand. But that would have probably put my head, you know, just expressing that, showing that rage would have put me on, um, I forgot what it's called. Beheaded. Would have hung me, right? Um, oh. For having even that idea in my home. But I cannot stop that. That is a reality of what I feel as a mother. You know, that is my reality of my rage. I'm just grateful I'm not back home. You know, the same way my husband left uh, here, when it, it all started, he went to Europe and stayed, slept outside in the winter in front of the UN building for about two weeks or 10 days. I forgot how many days. Every single night he was up all night in front of UN because he just couldn't go on living without doing something drastic. And as a result of him and others who did that, they started to talk about the issue. They started to bring it up in you and they started to, you know, put more and more actions in place. Right. Those both so-called demons had a reason, had a meaning. And it's our job to then in therapy say, thank you for being there for me. I got this from this point on. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you can cut whatever you want out. No, no, no. It's not. We're not cutting none of this no, we out. Cut we don't cut anything. We like to. We like our guests to see. Yeah, it's kind of hitting hit like that side. Certain, of words, certain 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 things are hitting us in real time. So it's like uh, we're taking. I'm taking it in. You know what I mean? And, and it kind of yeah. So because <laughs> you, you, you yeah. kind of understanding like us in the black community like. To do therapy to us is like you're you always thought you're crazy if you need therapy. Well, 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 not let's be I, real. I want to take it a step further. It's yeah. it's not even that you're crazy, you just it's like why? You know what I mean? Like, why can't okay. you just figure it out? Yeah. Why can't you your cousin figure it out? Meanwhile, everybody got everybody has things that they need to work through. Everybody. And we don't have the tools. That's the that's the key. And you think you do just because you you know we get we get tied up in just routine, going to work, paying the bills. You know what I mean? Going on vacation to release some stress here and there. But the tools to get through your past traumas, we don't have those. And some you people lash out. You don't have the permission to. Mm. You know, I used to work with people who were in organized crime. Let's call it. And pretty, some of them very high up. 
And some of them would see a consequence for just talking to me. Oh my God, it broke my heart. I was in tears. Because I was like, how, why? Why would this happen to you? Why is it, what, what, what am I doing wrong here? And my person was like, well, no, that's okay. I'm okay. I'm like, well, I'm not okay with you going to that. I don't care. You're okay. I'm not okay. And his thing was like, I'm used to that. Don't worry about it. Okay. That I'm not insane. okay still. But it that's is insane. like, it is, right? Thank yeah. you. I'm still the mama bear, no matter who I deal with. Right. They can feel that. I can tell. It's like it's it's that energy that you give off. And it's like it's almost like it's okay to be vulnerable. I felt that instantly when we were talking earlier. Like it just clicked. That's that's something I don't know, man. I don't know if a man can can do that. Cause it's like with men, you feel like you have to put up this force field. Like, nah, I'm just you know, nah, I'm okay, I'm good. But with a woman, it's like that with, with that energy, you you tend to say, Okay, it is okay. I can trust what you're saying. You know what I mean? You're not going to try to hurt me. No, no. You know I mean? Enough people have hurt you. I may unintentionally hurt you. So I will apologize right away and I want you to tell me if I do. Mm -hmm. The last thing I want is to be another hurt. And I always own up that I'm not always going to be able to be like, you know, with my guys who've gone through way more than I have. Sometimes I had to say like, here, look, I really care about you, but I cannot hear this. Do you want to get a different therapist? What are we going to do? Because this is just beyond me. And they were like, no, it's okay. I can, don't worry about it. I say it another way. <laughs> you can handle it. Man. But out of that comes relief, right? There's out of that transformation that happens. Out of what you, the insight you got, you know, if you sit with it, you, you really allow yourself to feel it. You work through it. Then it, there's, it's almost like that, whatever I like to call them shackles, whatever it was holding you back, mm -hmm. it comes off. And all of a sudden you see that the same situation doesn't cause the same feeling. The same situation doesn't seem as difficult. You know, let's say next time you're in the car, you're like, I should have said that, I should have said that. You can turn around and say, well, it's okay. Next time. Well, you try, so on and so forth. All of a sudden, you feel that's what everybody says. I feel this relief. You will end up living life differently, finding that you can do things that you never knew. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you don't understand. You're like opening small doors that yeah. I don't know about you, Dre, but I wanted to leave shut. Or I left mm -hmm. shut, or I'm like, there's no need to revisit that again. I don't know. That's the thing. That's the thing. You want to leave them shut, yeah. but why? I, that, I, me personally, I can't explain. I, when I close doors of hurt, mm. is because it's like I don't need that. To me, I feel like I don't need that weakness. Oh holding me back but really I'm really being weak by not opening that door and letting that letting them emotions and that feeling go I, I guess that's what it is I'm being weak by wait 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 wait, wait. I'm yeah. not allowing this no, I, there's I, nothing weak about you put that word out of your vocabulary okay think about it as you're not ready to or feel safe to does that change the way you feel about that? Yeah, it, it it does because, like I said, it's a lot. It's a it's a lot of unlike. It's a lot of unpacking. I think I need to do, but it, the unpacking, I'm starting some of the unpacking is going to be. Is I'm not going to lie. It's terrifying. What? Like I always, I always tell the story, like. Everybody knows, even Dre knows, like he was here. I, I lost my brother to, uh, my brother was murdered. I'm sorry. Yes. And the day that it happened, when I went to the hospital, I told myself as I'm walking through the door, as I see my mother crying and my brother crying, me being the oldest, I'm not allowed to cry. 
Like I had to be, I had to be the strong one. And I remember when I seen my brother come in the room as me trying to be the strong one, I couldn't stop tears. I felt so helpless. I couldn't stop tears from coming from my face. I couldn't stop. Like I felt it. Like I know I was, you know, I was, this is graphic, but I was wiping the blood off my brother's face so I can get a better sight of him. And I said not to, and I kept saying, telling myself, I'm not going to cry. And the next thing I felt was this warm sensation on my face. And I'm like, what's going on? And my mother grabbed me and I'm like, like, that's, and, and I still haven't unpacked a lot of that. That's some of that right there is is scary enough for me that I haven't unpacked a lot of that. Let's you know? try this. And I know you just met me, but imagine you know me. Imagine you've been working mm-hmm. and seeing me standing right by you. Just I'm gonna put my hand around. I'm gonna put my you know arm around your shoulder. It's gonna rub your back gently. The tears gonna come. I'm gonna say it's okay. It is okay. It really is okay. You can cry. You don't have to hold this in. This is not your burden. You guys cut this part out. But this is, you don't need to be strong for anyone. You don't deserve this. He's your brother too. And you have every right to have your feelings. And they will be your your brother, your mother will share that pain with you. You don't have to be alone with this. See now I wish I could hug you. Come here. Let me hold you. Yeah, I, I think this is as we're as we're doing this in real time, we we, we need some therapy. I think yeah. I think me and you should like you know separately obviously but yeah. you know like we we need to seek seek out therapy because that's just just hearing hearing even both of you speak just now and experiencing that with you man like it I yeah yeah bro yeah. It, it's my it might be time to get yeah. some therapy and start unpacking that yeah. definitely because even that little bit just helped you yeah. release, release it. You know, yeah. just allow yourself to cry. Maybe after this is done, just go have a good cry. You 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 deserve that. You own that. Nobody's else around. Yeah, let him have his time. Yeah. Sorry, this is still not how I do podcasts, but there's just some energy here, you know. No, that that was important for him, and we speak about this. We speak about this often, and you know we. Just, just like everybody does, we say, "Hey, we need to do that," and then we just kind of put it on the back burner. And but as you can see, even even talking about it a little bit, it's like it's like letting the lid off the pot a little bit, and then closing it back up, just so you don't have to experience that. And from what I saw just now, it's almost like somebody we trust, even though we just we just met. Like you're giving permission. It, it's 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 the weirdest thing and I've never thought about it until really seeing that in real time it's like you're giving us permission like oh it's okay to feel and it's okay to just let that emotion out no matter what it means and I think that's important and that's something that we don't grow up with we grow up with nah don't like we, don't we guilty of telling our you know your sons and and I got nephews and it's like what are you crying for don't cry no matter what it is don't cry Nah, you, know that that, up. you know where that's coming from? That's coming from the person who said that to you, being unable to tolerate your crying, your pain. This was actually about their lack of strength, not yours. Right. Wow. And I've never thought about it. I've never, ever thought about it. You just continue doing the same thing. I don't know why. I don't know why I say that. I, I never, I, I never, I never had a clue either. I just thought from Mel's that was how Mel's was supposed to be. It's like crying is weak. I, I'm just saying that word, but they, they, you know, I had uncles like that. Too. What are you crying for? Like, suck it up, man. Like, you 
got to tough it up. You, you're the oldest. You, you know what I mean? You got to tough this out. And that's all I was ever taught. You know, I'm the oldest out of my, my mother's kids. So it was like, you know, when my pops, when he left, it was like, all right, you the oldest. You got to, you know what I mean? You got to hold it down for me. You got to take, you got to be the strong one for everybody else. It's, yeah, you know, just a small conversation what I had with you lifted somewhat of a big weight off of my chest just mm-hmm. now. I'm glad. Because I, I was thinking about that all today. Like, mm-hmm. it was on my mind today, and I've been, like, very trying to bury it like I always do, but that, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Like, I didn't Thank know you. this was going to, I didn't know this was going to go here, but <laughs> I appreciate it. It is my pleasure. I mean, here's the thing. I'm okay with you being the strongest for everybody else. Fine. But who's going to be strong for you? You know? My EDBD person in the jail was my person for my guys. They had this tough exterior out in the world, and they also protected me. But I had to be there for the child they were inside, for their vulnerable self. Who is there for you to, you know, who is holding you, who is caring for you, who is attending to your wounds? Mm. And it doesn't have to be a romantic relationship. In a romantic relationship, the roles are also different. But who is doing that healing for you? Now, now, when you you did your work in, in prisons, did you or rehabilitation? You know, did did you ever come across like guys who, and I, I feel like you've said it, but I, I just want to kind of nail, nail this point home. These big tough guys that immediately just you said the right, you know, you touched the right nerve and they just broke down. You know what I mean? Because because I'm very surprised at you know what just happened with you know what I mean? Like just like that. It's almost like you're carrying all that all those emotions like right below the surface like you know what i mean like you're carrying it with you every day did, did you ever come across that before where did... all the time oh you know gosh. i mean that's the reality right you see someone for who they are not what they put up so you come here looking like this and this and that okay cool fine like you know trying to scare me but what are you trying to scare like, you're not going to do anything to me. I'm not going to do anything to you. Mm-hmm. The honesty of the relationship. You know, like I said, I had to prove that I am who I am. First, they would sit like this, you know, and I would be like, okay, that's okay. I'm okay with that. You know, joke around with them. And then little by little, we would have, you know, they would have transformations. I never forget. It's a funny story. Do I have time for a funny story? Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, <laughs> I felt very, I mean, a lot of these men were men and they were older than me, but to me, they were my children. So I have very, that feeling towards them. So one of my guys, <clears throat> I'm not sure how old he was, to be honest with you, but he always talked to me about this, his brother, who was, you know, the gang member and had this name and so on and so forth. And I was always like, well, no, it's okay. Don't you do that? You know, I'm always encouraging him against it. Right. And the funny thing was that I always would match up with the same people. They were, you know, active or very active or formerly active. And I would always come in. I was like, I respect your institution, but this is how I think about it. <laughs> you know, we would yeah. have this honest conversation. Yeah. So I would always be like, well, you know, it's okay. You just, you just don't do that. <laughs> Deputies would always get mad at me and be like, this is not what he is. This is not who he is. He doesn't, like, he's not showing you the truth. Right. So, you know, in, you know, in a lot of jails there, you know, it's like a fishbowl. You can see everything inside. So <laughs> this one time, he didn't see me. And I walked into this space. And he was throwing signs. And, like, the whole body language was there. <laughs> I was, like, shocked. Like, really? <laughs> This is the funny part. He turned around, saw me, straightened up, walked so gentlemanly downstairs. And the first thing he says, like, did you see that? 
I was like, yeah, what was that about? <laughs> and he was shocked. He was shocked that, yeah. I And I was like, okay, well, tell me the truth. He's like, well, I am that. I'm like, okay. But I'm not changing what I said. I still think you should get out. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And it was cool. It's almost was like a kid. Funny. It's almost like a kid getting busted by his mother. That's exactly what it was like. <laughs> as soon as I heard that, I'm like, "Yep, that's it. <laughs> that energy." He said, oh. "You know so what I mean? <laughs> you wasn't supposed to see that." I was not. That's what that was. Yeah. Wow. So let me let me ask you a question, and um, I, I feel like you stated it, but I, I just want to clarify: What would you say your mission? right now is or or, or just in life what is your mission honestly is to give people the life they deserve you know we all have the right to live a happy fulfilling life and i do that for my child i spend every minute of every day i'm going to talk about her a little bit if it's okay Hmm. and then you can see how uh, so she is five years old she's a performer she's been on a stage dancing since she was three, she had her solo performance at three years old. She is singing and she sings in tune. She actually does recitals. She dances, she does gymnastics. She is this amazing little performer at five years old and very artistic. Her um, art teacher is actually creating a portfolio for me. She won't let me take any of her work home. I haven't seen her work. Wow. And that is what I want for everyone. Right? I'm building her life to be amazing. I'm already seeing that I'm going to have an artist. I'm planning for, you know, playing, paying for high school already, right? So each and every one of us deserves to be the best version of ourselves. Mm. And what we need is to heal, right? Our name is Heal and Thrive Psychotherapy and Coaching. Healing is me, right? This is where I do what we ended up doing here. I have to say, this was this is not how I do podcasts. So I'm really honored that you really went there with me, and thank you for your vulnerability and your willingness to do the work. But yeah, thank you. And the healing is my part, and then the thriving is where my husband comes in. He's an ADHD professional coach, and what he does is that he takes you know sometimes we have clients that we both work with. And as I'm helping people understand the past and the connection to the now and how to heal and transform what the now is, he's oftentimes working with people on how to achieve the next step. You know, what to do, whether it's improving in their careers, whether it is in, you know, managing their ADHD symptoms, whether it is basically, you know, if they're in a school or if they're at work or they have kids, how to provide the best environment, how to get the environment. I'll give you this example really quickly. Yesterday, he is like in session, talks to me, talks to our other friend who's a professional. She's been a therapist for 30 years, trying to solve this one client's problem in the moment because he had messed up at the school, lied in the school. It was like a really big thing. Mm. And he's literally running around, talking to everybody to come up with what to do for that person in the session. As I was listening to him, I was like, wow, this man is amazing. Like, he doesn't let anything go. Right now, right here, he got to find a solution. That's, you know, that's kind of like what brings us to be what we are. Right. Right. So you said your husband does the, it's weird. It's the weirdest thing in the world. We would literally just talk about yeah, <laughs> having, having ADHD yeah, my brain. right before this, you know, not diagnosed, obviously, mm-hmm. but we were just talking about that. It's like, wait, what? Not, That's yeah. Funny. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that is hilarious. Yo, he, when, go ahead. I was going to say, I think you were supposed to come into our life today because <laughs> really like we, I needed this today, you know, and I really want to thank you. I'm just going to say that, but Drake, yeah. I'll toss it back to you. Oh, yeah. You're welcome. I'm really honored to have been there for you. Yeah. So what, what made you guys, like, really sit down and say, this is what we both want to do? Like, because cause that's such a, to me, I think, um, I, I'm not diagnosed with ADHD. I, my wife tells me I got it, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? And 
what what made you guys say this is such a good combination and this is how we want to help people like where where did you like really come up with that so we've been doing this i have been doing this all my you know all my professional life it's mm -hmm. always been about the same work i did today any setting i've been in till i had my child and you know, I just basically got beaten by the systems. I always brought up who I was and the system said, nope, I don't want you to do this. This is not how you do it. This is not how you should be doing it, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So I kept moving around the systems. Then I had my daughter and at two months old, my job was like, come back. And I'm like, my baby is a miracle baby. I was like, I was, I'm now leaving a miracle baby at home <laughs> at right. two months old. Absolutely. So I went and I started my private practice with the help of a very good friend. And as I was doing that, my husband, my husband has two MBAs. He was in corporate work for many years. He was a director, but he had this constant co collapse, I think is like collision all the time in a sense, a clash where he had this amazing ideas, but he was always pushed back to get into the box and do what you're told, which obviously doesn't work for an ADHD. Right. So that same, uh, our friend, um, Janice McAnally, actually, who is uh, a 30-year-old veteran ADHD therapist, also has ADHD, shout out to her. She said to Ruth, why don't you try coaching? Why don't you, you know, just do your own thing? And so Ruth did, you know, he became a coach. Actually, today he got his professional uh, coaching um, certification, which is like a, the next level. Right. I'm very excited for him. Um, nice. and, and thank you. And that's what happened. Yeah, he joined the business, transformed the business, called it Heal and Thrive. It was Heal and Thrive. And then he came and said, no, it's Heal and Thrive Psychotherapy and Coaching. Nice. And yeah, he he always said like, okay, you're doing the healing, but somebody's got to do the thriving. You know, this is, it's not enough to heal. You know, we need to expand and help people get to that point. It's not enough to heal. I, I, it's not enough to heal. Oh, my God. <laughs> just hearing that, it just hit home. I'm like, yeah, you're right. Once you heal, what do you do? Even in therapy. Like, it's just, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, I do get it. I get it. I'm sorry. I'm just having a revelation that, like, I know in real time. Because you was right. I mean, you, like I said, you don't understand how much you walking in today in this, in this interview we was oh. at this crossroad, and you kind of oh. helped us somewhat start putting us on a path. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's where Ruth comes. It's always about, like, you know, it's funny. We see the same client, same issue, completely different approaches. He is like, okay, well, fine. This happened. What are we going to do about it? I'm like, oh, this happened. Let's see where this comes from. Somehow we just create this continuum. Different sides, <laughs> different sides of the spectrum. That's all. That's why I tend to ask, like, all right, you know what? It's weird. Um, like with my wife, she's in there. She's going to hear me say this and probably cuss me out over there. Um, that's that's how I am. Like, I'm like, okay, what are we going to do? Like, if something happens, I don't really care about everything. What are we going to do about it? Like, I can't sit here and get, I can't sit here and go over and and just get be woe is me and get mad or get sad. Where do we go from here? Because that's the only thing that counts. So I'm kind of like that as well. Well, tell her I understand her. <laughs> as a wife of an ADHD, I totally get it. Let's sit down and talk. <laughs> You're right there. <laughs> um, so an another thing I had to ask is. Do you think, because I really feel like you're, like, it's not phoned in. I, I I went to, I actually went to a therapist when I was a kid. And um, there was, like, no connection. But I was also a kid. I didn't understand uh, the, the honestly, the, um, what, do you, what do you call it when it's good? Um, <laughs> the benefits. There you go. I didn't understand the benefits of therapy. So I would go in there, just kind of let the guy talk and, you know, he would be like, all right, you want to be done? Yeah, I want to be done and just walk out. Um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Oh, crap. Is that ADHD? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Darn it. Yeah. All right, hold on, because I, I was coming. Oh, yeah. So I, I didn't sense any compassion. Like, you know what I mean? With, with, with the therapist that I had. Like, I didn't think he really wanted to help. I get that with you, even in our short interaction here. Do you think 
that what you've dealt with from, you know, from, from your childhood, like helped you with that real compassion, because that's something that if you fake it, people pick up on it and they kind of like, they kind of step back, but it's a reason why we opened up to you. I didn't mean to earlier. It just happened. I'm just grateful. I am too, because to me, that kind of pushed me in a direction, but that, do you think your childhood helped you have that compassion for people? You see, it's two things. We're, as Iranians, we're born and raised that people matter, no matter what walk of life you're in. I always tell this story of like, if a car broke down in Iran, you're just going your way. You will see and it, so many people, mostly men, run to the car. One person is like, you know, trying to get the car moving right through their driver's seat and just like moving and pushing the car. Right. And before you know it, about 10 people are pushing that car out of the way, getting them going. Okay, goodbye. You got this. Good luck. Everybody dispersed. Wow. Instantly, right? That is our people. You see somebody is like a struggling to, you know, grab something. Or like somebody's like carrying a heavy weight. We just swarm around it. Here, a lot of times, like when I try to do that, people are like, no, I'm fine. Thank you. I'm good. You know, it, it goes against their independence. For us, it's like, you're crazy if you don't do that. Like, what is wrong with you? You have to show up. Right. So that's the part of it. And then you have to have seen pain to understand pain. You know, obviously with the people I worked with, I had never gone through the type of traumas they went through. But I also understood what it meant to feel fear, what it meant to be dismissed, what it meant to be hurt. You know, I didn't have to experience that firsthand. Right. Wow. As privileged and as lucky as I was in my own family, I also lived in this duality of a reality back home. Right. Man. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, we're gonna wrap this up. It's about that time, but I want to know where people can find you at because I think you will be a big help in a lot of people's life. And yeah. you know, tell us about you know how, where they can find you, your business, lay it all out for them if you don't mind. Oh, no, no, no. Thank you for that. So we are Heal and Thrive Psychotherapy and Coaching. Our Website is heal-tribe.com. We do have Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram all under the same name. If you just type it, search it, it shows up. Um, and then everyone who calls us will get a response back. We're not the kind that just ignores people. We don't like that at all. We Everybody who calls, we do offer free consultation to your clients, to your listeners. So... Um, have them call and we will respond. We will offer that free consultation. The, the truth is that no one deserves to be alone. And in today's world, no one should be. So no matter how complex you think people, you know, your problem, I mean, this is to your listeners. Honestly, no matter how complex you think your problems are, how much shame you carry, know that we've seen it. We've seen it. Mm. I mean, the type of people I have worked with, I've seen it all. You know, you can't, you can, you know, I have to keep their confidentiality, but the truth is that you can't, you know, I've seen it, the whole range. And right. there's 99.9% .9 there's always a reason for everything. Even for someone who is basically have no empathy, you know, that is because of the history of tremendous trauma. And very few people in the world are there. I worked in jails for four years. I was in this field for just a whole, in the trenches, for 12 years. Two people in the whole career, I saw that really you could feel like there was no soul. Two people. You can not imagine the number of people I had seen during these 12 years. It is extremely rare. And both of them, of course, tremendous horror stories that had rendered them the way it had. I can imagine. Oh, my God. <sighs> Goodness oh. gracious. Yeah. Heal and thrive. <laughs> Heal and thrive. Like a therapy and coaching, yes. We, listen, I can't 
say enough how much I appreciate you your time today, man. And I absolutely oh, thank yeah. you. And I yeah, really, man. truly, from the bottom of my heart, thank you because I, even how minor it might seem, you lifted somewhat of a weight off my chest. Just a conversation, having a conversation with you, and you know, I got to take which. The information you gave me, I got to start using that and applying that to myself moving forward. And I think that will probably start to help me heal. I just want to thank you. I, that's You're all. welcome. I am so <laughs> grateful for this opportunity. I'm so grateful for how open you both were. Thank you for allowing me to go where we went. That wasn't easy for you. I know that. And yes, I'm very happy to have been here for you. Yeah, we thank you. Thank you. Definitely. You're welcome. Definitely. All right. <laughs> so, yeah. As always, what Dre hates me saying at the end of the show, peace. Why?